like uh, e to the minus, uh, what was it, e to the minus omega over 2th, I think. Uh, and then the raising operator inside, inside and the raising operator outside. So they're together in a pure state. If you now think about this as a bipartite system and you trace over the inside, then the density matrix um, for the outside, uh, put a B, okay, the, for, so the density matrix for the outside mode um, is just thermal. So M is the occupation number. So this is, I guess, uh, first of all, it's diagonal, delta MM prime, and then a normalization factor. And then just the Boltzmann factor for the given mode. OK, so, so there's a thermal density matrix. And if I had included the, trans, you know, the, the, the fact that there's gray body factors, it won't be exactly thermal. There'll be a, the transmission factor will appear somewhere and propagate through. And it won't be like thermal because, again, this is a decay is a non-equilibrium process. But it will still, the main point is it's not a pure state. The inside and the outside are entangled. This is not a pure state. Um, and so if we form the uh, von Neumann entropy, um, where that's the probability of being in the nth state, uh, this is positive. So now if we, so actually good. So, so, so far for convenience, I've been using a basis of modes which are eigenstates. These are eigenstates of, again, of the frequency of the observer infinity, the observer in the asymptotic Minkowski space. But I want to now talk about the time evolution of the black hole so instead, we'll go to some basis of wave packets. And the same principles apply. For the sake of discussion, maybe what's useful to think about wave packets that are fairly wide in position space and therefore narrow in frequency. So just, just for the sake of discussion, we can talk about them having some typical frequency. Um, but but they're, they're finite in time extent and, and much, much narrower than the lifetime of the black hole. The black hole is a very long lifetime. So the tip, this, this is the, the, the typical, it's always worth remembering, a black hole has one scale, one distance scale, which is its size. So for the typical Hawking photon, the typical uh, temperature is one over that size. So for the, tip, the typical sort of wavelength for an emitted Hawking photon, again, is the radius of the black hole. So this is a wave packet which is several times the radius of the black hole in length, but that still is much, much shorter than the overall lifetime of the black hole. So anyway, so this, is, this gives a process which is somewhat localized in time. And so we have our black hole, and it's emitting a series of Hawking photons. And what I want to plot over here is the total von Neumann, the fine grain, v, Vn. I'll, I'll always put von Neumann there to remind you that it's fine grained. The total fine grained entropy of the Hawking radiation. And so um, here's, here's time. Uh, here is, there'll be several entropies on this. Here's, uh, so I'll, here's the, begin, here's time zero where the, where the whole process, where the black hole forms. Over here is the time where the, where the black hole evaporation is complete. And, and each emitted Hawking photon, again, has some von Neumann entropy. And this just keeps going, well, up and up and up. Now, um, it keeps going up in the approximation that the fields are just free fields in a, in a, in a specified metric. You can put in. The, 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 the fact that the, that the black hole is getting smaller with time, but in the approximation that it's just free fields in a fixed metric, then each, and each, e then, then each uh, emission is independent, it's a product state, and the von Neumann entropy just adds. Uh, Joe, at this point, uh, does your discussion depend on the time slicing? No, well, I mean, it depends. There, it, um, all the, the time here is just the time at infinity. In some, the time here is just the time at infinity. Thanks. Uh, yeah. No. There's no no time slicing yet. Right. Now. Yeah. Uh, Started at zero. With each time here, here is Schwarzschild time. No. The, this is Schwarzschild time. The time. 
the time seen by an observer outside the black hole watching the radiation come out. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for always, yeah, please always be sure I'm clear. So um, now, now, of course, there are interactions. In the simplest case, the only interaction is gravity. And so the gravitational interaction between Hawking photons is, is small because gravity is a weak interaction at long energy. And so you would think, and you'd be right, that, um, that, um, that yes, there'll be corrections to this, but they'll change the slope by, by an epsilon amount. The slope will stay basically the same. As I was writing this lecture, I realized there's a really interesting calculation one can do. It's probably in the literature. Maybe one of you can tell me that it's in the literature. But there's a very obvious source of interaction between the Hawking photons because let's suppose in the first few emissions you happen to emit sort of more than the average, since this is a statistical process. Then the black hole will decay a little faster, it will be hotter, and that will affect the later Hawking photons. So there's a very obvious um, interaction between the photons, which is really the dominant effect. Um, which is really the dominant effect. You, it, it should be very easy. It would take, like, it would take a, you know, a little time to set. It should be very easy, at least maybe in some toy model, to work out the, the, how large an effect that has on this curve. And without doing the calculation, I'm quite certain that it's parametrically small in, um, in the Planck length over the radius of the black hole. Um, this must have been done. Does anyone know no, if this has been done? Uh, you in your book. You mean, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> in my book, okay, it's finished precisely the way you finished last lecture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, if you mean the, uh, uh, the, uh, how's called, the change of the spectra because the mass is changing yeah, yeah, yeah. and correction, yeah. 1 over m squared, then people were doing it using this wide metric approximation. <laughs> With the mass, or it's I don't think I need such anything so fancy. But I, do, I no, think. No, no, but yeah. You see, you mean corrections yeah. which are due to the fact that Specific, is specifically, right, so specifically the correction to the page curve. Uh, this is assuming. Uh, this is this, this. This is always drawn assuming independent emissions, and it's asserted that it's robust. And, and I think it would be nice, and, and I, it's, it's a homework problem. No. To figure out to figure out what the correction is due again to the fact that it's not a product because if there are more emitted earlier, the later ones are hotter and so on. Yeah, yeah. Now th I'm sure this must be done, but but I've, it occurred to me I'd never seen it before, and it's easy to do. I don't think it was. Really? Okay. Well, um, um, anyway, anyway. Um, so so I'm going to assert that this curve is robust against small corrections. Now. Um, now, again, what I've plotted here is um, the von Neumann entropy of the radiation up to, up to the given. So again, this is the von Neumann, total von Neumann entropy of the radiation up to some given time. I'll call that E for early, just the early Hawking radiation up to whatever time one is looking at. But actually, there are two other, there are two other entropies which follow the exact same curve. Well, actually, let's assume, let's assume that the black hole starts in a pure state. So the whole system's in a pure state. If the system's in a pure state, then when, when we divide it into two halves, the von Neumann entropy of each half is the same. So assuming a pure start. Then the von Neumann entropy of the radiation is equal to the von Neumann entropy of the remaining black hole, and it's also equal to the entanglement between the two. So all three of those are following this same curve. Before I go on, before I go on, I, I said, um, assuming the black hole starts out in a pure state. Now, Every so often, someone will say to me, a pure state can't be a black hole because a black hole is thermal. That's just not true. Um, you can, you know, imagine that you collapse a shell of coherent radiation. It's in a pure quantum state. It will surely form a black hole. So yes, black holes can be in pure states. Actually, we don't have to, we don't have to um, be so precise with how we form the black hole because an estimate I'll make later on 
shows that if you form the black hole, even in a very careless way, um, the scale of its initial von Neumann entropy, its initial lack of purity, is very small on the scale of, of this figure. Now, there's another curve I want to draw, um, which is which, which, which just goes the other way. What is this? That is the Bekenstein-Hawking Bekenstein -Hawking entropy of the black hole. So capital B, capital H is Bekenstein-Hawking, little b, little h is black hole. And it goes down because the black hole starts out big and ends up small. And so you see um, that already right around the midpoint of the life of the black hole, we run into the same problem that we ran into at the end of the previous lecture. Um, the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy basically is a thermodynamic entropy. It, the black hole satisfies laws of thermodynamics uh, with this playing that role. So it's a thermodynamic entropy, a coarse-grained entropy, um, whereas we're just calculating here the fine-grained entropy of the same system. And it's, it's not disturbing that a coarse grain entropy is larger than a fine grain entropy. That's what coarse graining does. We can start the black hole in a special part of its phase space. So it has, so it's, 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 um, but of course, the opposite situation is, doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for a fine grain entropy to exceed a coarse grain entropy. And so again, around the midpoint of the life of the black hole, um, we, we encounter the, the, uh, the issue that we can no, it seems that we can no longer give a statistical interpretation to the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. But the sum of these physics is not conserved, is what I'm saying. You know, actually, neither, these lines are not exactly straight because um, the, the temperature is changing, and I have, I have no reason to think the sum is conserved. No. No, no, because I the, think actually the increase, the entropy of the black hole uh, of radiation is. Moses yes, yes. Of the of Good. Because you say, because, again, again, coming back to the fact that this is a non equilibrium process, there's no reason they should sum to anything constant. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so again, first problem is that we lose the, the statistical interpretation, but there's really a second problem here because at, if the black hole evaporation proceeds to completion, so after the black hole evaporation is done, all we have is the, uh, the Hawking radiation. That's the entire system. And the entire system is no longer in a pure state. It, it, um, it has a large von Neumann entropy. And so we've evolved from the pure initial state to this highly mixed final state. Uh, you know, you might say, can't the curve just kind of just suddenly do that? But no, because it basically, the black, well, um, the, the last few Hawking photons have a very small number of possible states compared to the much larger number emitted earlier. And there's no way that that small number of Hawking photons can sort of carry all of the possible um, states that one needs to, you know, that are, that, are, that are represented by the entanglement between the, the inside and the outside. So, no. But on the other side, you can imagine that at the last stages of evaporation, radiation is very far away from the Hawking radiation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll come back to that. Thank you. We'll come back to that. Yes, yes, yes. So, that's, that's what you're describing is what I'm calling a lo what I would call a long lived remnant, and I will come back to that. Thank you. But assuming that this happens fairly quickly, which we'll come back to, then, then there's no way. And so, we have, if we assume that, again, once the black hole's Planck size, there's no conserved quantities, it should keep going and evaporate, um, we, have, we have pure to mixed evolution. So um, in terms of density matrices, and I think I want to save these equations, so I'll write them over here. Um, Hawking's assertion is that the evolution in the system is that the final density matrix so first of all, for Schrodinger evolution, for Schrodinger evolution, 
the final density matrix um, is these ij for the states of the black hole. Final ij uh, is just unit, actually I want to use ii prime, is, is just, unitary, just a unitary uh, transformation. Okay, so Schrodinger evolution, the final density matrix um, would, would um, be a unitary rotation of the initial one. And this evolution conserves von Neumann entropies because it the eigenvalues of rho obviously don't change. Um, whereas what Hawking is saying is that, lo that this study of black hole evaporation says that there has to be some more general um, relation, the dollar matrix he called it, between the two. Okay, so, so this is the claimed breakdown of quantum mechanics that one sees in black hole decay. Okay, now um, let me draw another curve here. Suppose, well, so, so, um, suppose we want to, well, suppose we, suppose that Hawking is wrong. Suppose that through some mechanism we haven't yet identified, the final state really is pure. Then if, if the, so uh, leaving aside possible exotic things that happen at the end and later of the evaporation, if we want the, the, um, the uh, von Neumann entropy to drop to zero kind of smoothly, and in particular, in particular, if we want to retain the statistical interpretation of this of the Bekstein-Hawking entropy, we never want the fine-grained entropy to rise um, above the coarse-grained one. Um, the actual curve has to be something like that, the page curve. Um, um, and so, what you learn from this is that if, in fact, the process, the Hawking process, is to be unitary. Um, the corrections to this calculation have to become large of order one around the midpoint of the life of the black hole when it's still very large, when the curvatures are small, and where you would think that, that you could trust uh, you know, the theory of just Einstein gravity plus quantum mechanics as an effective field theory. So that so so if if, if um, good. also um, Page made an interest so so Page argued that very likely the black hole follows quite closely the Hawking curve on the way up and the Bekenstein Hawking curve on the way down. Um, his his logic was that the black hole is a thermal system; it's very um, chaotic. Therefore, the combined system of the black hole and the Hawking radiation is likely to be in a rather random state in the total Hilbert space. And if you assume that and then calculate the von Neumann entries of the two halves, you find that it really does this. It rises almost exactly following the Hawking curve to the midpoint and then very abruptly turns over and follows the coarse grained curve on the way down. The reason is that the sizes of the Hilbert spaces um, here are exponential in the number of Hawking photons, the number of bits. So you, before the midpoint, the black hole Hilbert space is much larger because, again, it's exponential in the difference of the number of bits. After the midpoint, rather abruptly, the radiation has a much larger Hilbert space. And so, again, this is not, this is not important. It's, it's convenient to assume this. But as long as the curve goes up and then comes down, it's going to differ at order one from, uh, fr from the Hawking curve. And so it doesn't matter that it, exa that it, that it does this. But, uh, Joe, I yes. think one of the key assumptions on which it follows that Page was assuming, if I talk to him, that the total size of Hilbert space is not, I mean, dimension, is not changing. You see? And uh, this is not obvious fact, and this assumption is correct, but if you will take these things in black hole of solar mm -hmm. mass, 
when it will reduce its size by half, okay, mm -hmm. should start to emit information. And imagine that many black holes of the same half of mass of the sun, but were formed beginning from different initial conditions. Mm -hmm. Then you will get hairs. You see infinite number yep. of hairs, roughly speaking, for the black hole of the given size. Because depending, it started with three mass of sun mm -hmm. to evaporate, 10, mm -hmm. 15, and etc. The amount of information which will, it will be emitting when it has mass half of the mass of the sun will be different. Um. Okay, I, 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 yeah, I, I um, certainly this curve can depend on the initial conditions, and in fact, we could imagine starting it in, with a, a higher, with a we, we could imagine actually starting the system in a more mixed state. But the, the, the yeah, the general qualitative feature that that the the um, the Venomian entry has to do this is is, is all I want to uh, take away from this. Now, now, um, so, yes. Okay, I, I, this is, I, I, for the purpose of the students, I don't think we want, we need to discuss, yeah, yeah, thanks, thank you, yeah. Um, but what I, what I do want to do is, I want to contrast, so, so again, there's an intuition that says if the black hole radiates more or less like a black body, then it should behave like any other thermal system we know, for example, you know, a burning piece of coal. So suppose we have a piece of coal, suppose it starts at absolute zero, um, so it's in a pure state, and we set it on fire with a laser, uh, so it's still in a pure state. And it's burning, even though it's in a pure state. Um, and it starts to emit photons. And those photons, so here's my coal. Those photons, the whole system's in a pure state, but those photons will surely be entangled with the remaining coal. There'll be photon, phonons, whatever, bouncing around inside the coal, and they'll be entangled. And so the coal will also follow a similar rising curve. And, but also, of course, I told you how we set the coal on fire. We know the whole system's in a pure state. So we know once the coal is done burning and we have all these outgoing pho photons, we know that those photons are back in a pure state because this, is, this, is, this satisfies ordinary quantum mechanics. So in fact, burning coal satisfies a, a curve much like this with its von Neumann entropy. Now, the, the coarse-grained entropy, the thermodynamic entropy of the outgoing radiation just goes up and up and up as the coal curves. So if you're talking about as the coal burns. So if you're talking about the coal, the, the, the coarse-grained entropy, the fine-grained entropy does something like page. But the coarse grain entropy, the thermodynamic entropy, does something like the Hawking curve, going up and up and up. And so there was a very natural reaction that somehow Hawking's calculation has implicitly coarse grained. And, and, and what he calculated was really a coarse grain entropy. Um, and if you fix his calculation, um, you would get this answer. Um, and we're still trying to fix his calculation 40 years later because the difference between the coal and the, um, the black hole is the black hole has a horizon. The, again, the same picture, but now where this is a horizon rather than the, 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 um, the, the coal, um, um, the entanglement is between things outside the horizon and things behind the horizon. And unlike the case of the coal, the things behind the horizon cannot rattle around and escape or in some way imprint their state on, on later radiation. So I mean, the very basic thing that makes, Haw that makes Hawking's paradox a paradox is that the black hole has a horizon. OK. Um, Any questions from students? So, um, so, 
So coarse grain entropy is a thermodynamic entropy. What it, what it's, the, it's the following. Um, if, 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 you, if, if, if you consider all, so, so for the outgoing Hawking radiation, if you'd consider all, all possible quantum states of that radiation, which looks macroscopically the same as this one, their number would give you the coarse grain entropy. So the fact that the fine grain entropy is small in that is saying that um, the radiation is, is, is exploring a smaller set of states than it might be. Whereas, if, for example, if the radiation were, uh, were, something, were actually something that was in contact with a larger thermal bath, then in fact it would, as it thermalizes, it would fill out its entire you know, space of states. So, so that's the difference. Yeah. Question, please. Okay, good. This is something I was going to say later, but I'll say it now. Right. So, um, so the um, right. So, so you say quantum field theory and curse phase. I want. I want to say uh, quantum gravity is effective field theory. It's the same thing, but I want to. It's 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 a slightly more 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 general concept. And our in in all other places where we use effective field theory. Um, the signal for its breakdown is that there is some large locally measurable quantity, a time derivative that's very large, a curvature that's very large, an energy that's very large. And um, in this problem, um, I guess I haven't drawn a black hole yet today, but in this problem we can certain, I mean, um, the local geometry is smooth. There's no local, there's no, there's no, there's no place, you know, if you, if you think about the black hole geometry up to this time, very late, very late, there is the singularity. But if we consider the black hole geometry up to this time, there, there is no large curvature or time derivative in the, back, in the problem that would lead you to think that effective field theory breaks down. So the question is, um, you know, what, if, 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 if um, Hawking is wrong, the, the question is, you know, why does local field theory, why does effective field theory break down and how does it break down? And, and yeah, that's, that's another way to phrase the problem. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a, I won't say, I mean, they're, they're distinct choices. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, well, I will come to a menu of choices before too long. Yeah. Actually, uh, uh, yeah, another question, please. Well, um, you know, I, I actually didn't, I never needed to actually talk about the coarse grain entropy. I did it only to provide kind of a context for interpreting these curves. But in the end, the, the, the sharp problem is that the, the fine grained entropy, the precisely defined thing, um, if it behaves as the calculation seems to show, it is inconsistent with you know, the evolution, the normal evolution law in quantum mechanics. Yeah. So then I want to actually give you one more way of characterizing this discrepancy, which is, which is uh, due to Samir Mathur, and it's, it's very nice. Um, so um, I want to... I want to somewhere late in the life. So, so again, actually, um, so right. So Don Page, Don Page um, emphasized the sort of importance of the dis the difference between the early the early and the late black hole, and and also uh, Hayden and Preskill showed that this has interesting quantum information properties, which I may come to. Um, but anyway, let's consider. I want to consider now a Hawking photon. Um, in the later part of the life of the black hole when, when we have this discrepancy between the Hawking curve and the curve that we would expect for a thermal object. 
Um, and, I want to, and so I want to think about three subsystems. I want to think about the Hawking photon we're emitting at this time, all the prior Hawking radiation, which I'll still call E, and also um, the, the partner of B behind the horizon. So I have these three subsystems. And when you have three subsystems, there is this strong subadditivity. Um, so we take, let's say, B and B hat, and we take B and E, and the sum of, so, so we take this, sub, this two-part subsystem and its von Neumann entropy, this two-part subsystem and its von Neumann entropy, and that exceeds, or is it greater than or equal to, the total von Neumann entropy plus that of B. B is, you know, is singled out here in the way it appears. Okay, and now in this case, as we already know from the, um, from the Hawking calculation, the, the, the near horizon subsystem is in a pure state. It's in uh, its ground state. So this von Neumann entropy is zero. And um, this von Neumann entropy then, if this, if, if the, if these two, if this subsystem's in a pure state, the von Neumann entropy of here is equal to than just the entropy of E by itself. And so what we come to is that we get a simpler inequality. And actually, um, actually uh, this has to be an equals because there's another ordinary, ordinary subadditivity says that this can't be greater than the sum of those two. So it's equal. So now what does this say? This, this, is the, this, is, this is the von Neumann entropy of the radiation before B appeared. This is after it appears. And this inequality says it just goes up. So the, 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 the strong subadditivity um, inequality gives you the Hawking curve. It tells you that, um, that um, the, the um, outgoing radiation is continually becoming less and less pure. And so if you, um, if you are going to escape that argument, you somehow have to deal with this. Now, um, one thing that's nice about Samir's version of the problem is that um, often when one talks about why this is a paradox, you know, you tend to wander off into talking about these, these nice slices, these long space-like slices that follow the interior geometry and, and have, you know, lots, okay. And, and um, you know, they're kind of strange. Maybe there's a problem with that. But, von, but, but Mathur's version of the paradox refers only to things just out, things that are outside the horizon, B and E, and things that are just behind the horizon, B hat. And so it, it's a sharper version of the paradox, and it shows that, um, that, that dwelling on the odd properties of these nice slices is probably not fruitful in figuring out what's wrong here. Okay. So why, why it's not right to draw this nice slice? Oh, I didn't say it's not right. I'm saying that we don't have to discuss whether it's not right or not. Well, so, so um, you know, there are various proposals that, that, uh, that um, well, there have been attempts to, to explain what was wrong with Hawking, Hawking's argument in terms of various features of the right slice. And I'm just saying this doesn't seem like it's, this, this, doesn't, this won't deal with Mathur's version of the problem. So we don't need to think so much about nice slices. So what nice slices, I mean Cauchy complete. Cauchy complete, right, right. Moment, right. If you will have Cauchy complete, then there is no problem with unitarity. Only if your black hole evaporated, and yeah. if you will yeah. make this corner, then yeah. there is problem because there is no yeah. question. Well, we're so, but we, well, uh, we, will use this in, we will use this way of thinking about the problem later on, the fact that, it's, that it appears already um, sort of very close to the horizon. So, yes? Okay, so for the burning coal, um, for the burning coal, let's think about that. Um, so, I think there is, I think there is no analog 
for the burning coal of this statement. The, produc the production process for the, the, um, the radiation is just something inside. So, so, so the point is, with the Hawking process, every time a photon escapes, another thing is produced inside which is entangled with it. With the burning coal, one of these interior quanta can just kind of come to the surface and leak out. And, and it doesn't leave behind any entanglement. So, so the assumption that the coal has a subsystem such that this is true is, is not true. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, good question. A good question. A good. Qu that's a good question. Um, so, ah, good. So, um, one of the things that makes the paradox so robust, robust, is that the discrepancy between one calculation and another calculation is really order one. And so, um, it the, the this this factorization holds again in the approximation of call it quantum field theory and curve space time. And then corrections to that are always expected to be parametrically small in kind of the size of the black hole. Now, you know, with this subject, you can always, I mean, you know, you know a, a lot of, well, you, you, could, you could try to study this more closely and see if there's a, there's a um, loophole. But, but certainly, you know, um, I don't think, I mean, the, I mean, the basic problem again is that coal has a horizon, doesn't have a horizon, and the black hole does, and I, I don't think that small corrections to some of these assumptions are where one is going to, you know, cure the problem. But let's assume that effective theory is exactly valid. Yes. In this case, do we know that the Hilbert space is factorized? Yeah, 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 because it's just, uh, in, the, in that case, the oscillators, you know, we, we, in that case, you have three fields. You have the os you know you you have, you, have, you have each of them expanded in oscillators and so the Hilbert space is a product of the Fox spaces, yeah. Okay, so to summarize where we are, um, we have um, there there so so twenty or more years of banging on this paradox. Um, you know, leads to sort of three classes of, of things for what might happen. One is information loss in, in um, the form Hawking described. Two is somehow the information uh, that's out, it escapes as in, page, as in page, meaning it escapes in the Hawking radiation. The it, follow, it, somehow, it somehow finds a way to follow the page curve. Either there's a mistake in the reasoning or there is a breakdown of effective field theory that we, we can't, we, we hasn't been understood in such a way that information escapes a la page. And there's a third choice here which has been already mentioned, it, which is remnants of one sort or another. So suppose that the evaporation just... Well, so... so when the problem first appears, the black hole is still large and smooth, but eventually, late in its life, it becomes Planck-sized in curvature, and we, don't, we can't use the Hawking calculation. Maybe it just stops decaying. And so the final state of the system is pure. There is the outgoing Hawking radiation in a very mixed state because it's entangled with this tiny remnant that... that, um, that um, must have a large number of internal states. And there are different flavors of remnant. You could imagine a remnant which is eternal, or you could imagine a remnant which slowly decays, because if it decays over a long enough time scale with low enough energy photons, eventually it has sort of enough state phase space uh, to be able to carry away the large number of internal states. Um, so, you, so you'd have remnants either eternal or long-lived. And most attempts, although it's not obvious, most attempts to um, figure out what goes on with the black hole <coughs> fall into one of these three categories. So um, what I'd like to do now is to, um, 
to describe just briefly the problems with each of these um, and then go on to um, ADS-CFT. So information loss, um, this, this um, here we are, this modified evolution law. So um, what's wrong? Well, okay, so what's wrong? I've, I've, given you, I've told you one thing that's wrong with it, that if you, it, it's not what Cole does, and physics should be universal. Um, there's more specific things. So an evaporating black hole is a pretty um, exotic thing. But if, if, if this is what's happening, what this, this says that at a fundamental level, the laws of quantum gravity are not the quantum mechanics that we know. Now, in ordinary space, quantum gravity effects will be happening only virtually at very high energy scales. But if this is the fundamental law, even if it's happening at short distance scales, there's a very basic, um, there's a very basic thing in quantum physics, in quantum field theory, that things that are happening at short distance scales can feed down, will, will feed down to lower energies through low dimension operators. And in fact, um, so there's a nice paper by um, like Ellis, Shrednitsky, and collaborators from many years ago who, who actually studied this feed down process and argued that, um, that in fact, if, if, um, if um, this is happening at a fundamental level, we would expect to see violations of ordinary quantum mechanics even in in low energy physics. Um, there's also a, a, a problem of principle which was pointed out by I, Banks, Peskin, and Susskind. Again, all, most of these things were about 20 years ago. Um, there was kind of a, a heyday of interest in the information problem. How about 30? 30? 30? No, 93. 93. The 90s. The, yeah. um, and, and it's the statement that that, that dollar matrix evolution does not conserve energy. So let's look at the consequences of time translation invariance. Now, now if we have time translation invariance, oops, that's a prime, then um, the, 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 the statement, the, the requirement that this be invariant under time translation invariance would say, that um, what e i minus e i prime equals e sub j minus e sub j prime. Okay, so there's some some condition on the total energies of all four indices. For the ordinary Schrodinger evolution, the the constraint is that e sub i equals e sub j, and e sub i prime equals e sub j times. So for Schrodinger, e sub i equals E sub j, e sub i prime equals e sub i it equals sorry e sub i prime equals e sub j prime. So know this theorem. Know this theorem is weaker is weaker uh, with dollar matrix evolution than with Schrodinger evolution. And in fact, it allows it allows a transition from from some initial state of definite energy e sub i equals e sub i prime can go to a final state, a final density matrix, in which the energy has changed. So, so we, you don't get Noether's theorem with dollar matrix evolution. It allows transitions from an initial state of definite energy to a final state of a different definite energy. Moreover, and this, argu this argument is given more in more detail by Banks, Peskin, and Susskind in, in a more detailed model of what this means. But, but if we suppose that the evolution, that the process that violates um, purity is local, more or less, in time, local in time means smooth in energy, and therefore it can't have the second delta function. So, so there's two delta functions for Schrodinger evolution. There's one delta function for dollar matrix evolution, and if the dollar matrix process is, is, is local in time, there's only one delta function, and therefore this will happen. So, so um, the assertion of Banks, Peskin, and Susskind is that, um, that um, Hawking's, Hawking's 
uh, modification of quantum mechanics leads to large uh, violation of energy conservation all over the place and all the time. Um, 30 years ago, 84. Okay, okay, you've got, you've got the, the iPad there. I can't argue with you. Um, okay, yeah. Now, um, okay, so, so, oh, Rami. Yeah, okay, good, good. I'll come back to that. I'll come back, I'll come back to Andrew. Thank you, thank you. you. Remind me? I will remind you at the appropriate time, but yeah, yeah. Question? Can you see specifically what the source of violation of time So, yes. If, I'll tell you what Banks, Pesky, they wrote down a more detailed model of how this comes about, kind of a, 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 differ, a differential model. This, this, of course, is an S matrix, a final, they wrote down a differential in time model of this. And one way you can think about what their model comes down, they argue that under rather broad conditions, this is equivalent to having a Hamiltonian whose coupling constants are random functions of space and time. So it's, it's, like, it's like space time is, is dirty. It, that is, you have a Hamiltonian which is a random function of space and time. And if, 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 if you have these ran, this, this random background, even if the average of the background is time translation invariant, um, the fact that the Hamiltonian, in fact, is time dependent means that you will be creating and destroying energy. So that's, that's kind of what comes out of a more, more physical model. Um, I should say, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm kind of revisiting 20 to 30 year old arguments. And, and, and the good thing is we have something better to talk about. So I, I won't dwell on these in every detail, but I want to give you the, the landscape of possibilities. OK, so those are kind of the issues with information loss. Um, with um, with this, there's not much more to say, um, except we've already said, if this is true, and this, this has, okay, the nice things here are, again, a universality of thermal properties. Also, this is the only alternative in which the bekenstein hawking entropy has a statistical interpretation. With both of the others, with both of the others, you have this mismatch of coarse and fine grain entropies. And so it has nice properties. Um, the bad thing is that, that, that it seems as though information has to travel in some sense faster than the speed of light to get from the outs inside to the outside. And or, or said differently, low energy field theory has to break down in a regime where we thought it was valid. With remnants, um, with remnants of the most obvious problem, again, is loss of the statistical interpretation. But also, remember, we could have started with an arbitrarily large black hole. So the remnants. The Hawking calculation, the, you know, the, 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 we, try, we, we understand the radiation until we get a Planck-sized, Planck-massed, more or less, bit. We could have started with an arbitrarily large black hole. And, and, um, and so this thing has to have an, un, really, an, there's no upper limit, has to have an unbounded number of possible internal states. You could try to actually imagine how it comes about. You could imagine that what's happening is, there's a geometry that has kind of a large, this was our picture of a remnant back in the bad old days of uh, before ADS-CFT. The remnant uh, had a little opening, a little, a, little, a little opening into our universe, but an enormous in inside that could carry a large number of states. But again, this is, so this is some small object with a mass of around uh, 10 to the minus 5 grams, the Planck mass, or maybe a little more than that with some enormous number of internal states. And you would expect then, well, first off, there would be no thermal equilibrium because you, you, you could all, you know, thermally, thermally, you know, you could produce these without bounds because there's an, in, there's an there's a, they have an infinite number of possible internal states. Also, just quantum mechanically, any, you, they should be pair produced, again, with an unbounded rate. Now, and, and so, and so the, but, the, 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 the arguments against remnants were that that, that just doesn't make sense. But Joe, okay, yes. just to make sense of it, yes. let me give a simple example. Take yes. closed units, huge. Yes. Put the one electric charge. Match it to Minkowski space. Okay, this will look like elementary particle, but the number of internal state can be arbitrarily Good. large Good. and it will contradict to nothing. Good. And then black hole, by the way, all this degeneracy is in so-called absolute future. So you cannot enter in any calculations this degeneracy for the decay rate in our space. Okay, I want to come back to this picture that you, you know, you, it's similar, I think it's similar to this picture of this later on. But, but, but you know, 
you could easily imagine. So, so if something better hadn't come along, we would still be arguing about this menu of possibilities. The arguments would go on forever. There are still papers appearing regularly that argue that the problems that have been asserted with this or the problems that would have been asserted with this are avoidable. And fortunate, but of course, these, everything here is scenarios. It's arguments that think something is breaking down, but what one needs is a theory. And happily, we now have more of a theory than we used to have, namely we have ADS-CFT, and so that will be my next subject. But before I go, I wanted to mention just briefly sort of a couple of things that one might have thought about that fit into these various categories. So um, the, the Penrose diagram for a decaying black hole. So um, here's the Penrose diagram uh, for a black hole that's not decaying. And I've, it's Penrose rather than Kruskal because I've pulled in the, uh, the singularity by some kind of conformal transformation. Um, but if it's decaying, then after some time, it has to be the Penrose diagram of flat space. And so the whole Penrose diagram looks like this. This is the singularity. This is the horizon. And um, so the, the part of, so, so the curvature is small until you get to the region of the singularity. Once you get there, you can start making up scenarios for what the full theory of quantum gravity might do. And one scenario is that it just it ends up being smoothed out by gravitational dynamics. And, um, and then you fit in some new region of space. And so the whole picture you know, looks something like this, just a smooth space, no true horizon. No true horizon because um, you know, you can see behind it eventually. And so where is this in this um, set of possibilities? Well, it's a long-lived remnant because um, if we follow kind of the last light ray before the geometry starts to be modified, by this time, almost all the Hawking radiation has escaped. This is a Planck-sized object. And so we're far, far along on the page curve. We're way high. And so but then because eventually we can see inside, eventually the information escapes, it must be escaping again through very low energy photons emitted over a very long time scale. So that picture is a, is a remnant. Um, how about this? So again, we come back to our singularity. Suppose instead at the singularity, um, what happens is the inside of the black hole breaks off in a baby universe. So topology change, a picture we used to draw many times. You know, right after the heyday of, of perturbative string theory, we said, hey, if string can do it, universes can do it. Now that looks like information loss because heuristically information is being carried away with the universe. And maybe it is, although I have to tell you that Strominger argued that in fact, it's not information loss because if you want to start talking about the quantum theory of topology change, uh, you need to third quantize. You have to worry about the wave function of the baby universe. And when you, you, know, you need a field that creates and destroys baby universes. And if you do this in a systematic way, that in fact coherence is not lost, this actually becomes another long lived remnant um, with, with a twist. With a twist because the, the final state depends on the wave function for the baby universe. Um, what we used to call alpha parameters. And I mentioned this partly because I think it was Rami who, who, who said that, um, that um, uh, Unruh, in order to avoid the arguments against information loss, has, has a model which, which seems to avoid the arguments against information loss. And I think it's morally equivalent to what Andy said. That is, information is not lost. Um, there are random parameters, which are these wave functions of the baby universe and you end up with a remnant, a long-lived remnant. But, you know, again, one could go around these circles forever if we didn't have more information. And happily, we have more information, and that's my next subject, ADS-CFT. So why you don't like this last picture, which I found beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> I, pro I wrote papers about this picture. I know, but... I, uh, what is wrong about it? What is wrong? 
What's wrong about it is that um, ah um, what's wrong about it is well, I have to tell you that well third quantization may come back. <laughs> you know, it's 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 looming again. But but um, let rather than rather than argue the merits of these things, let's let's inject some new information. Okay. So you don't say that you don't like it, and you don't say that you like it. I'm, I'm pretty much agnostic about everything, <laughs> I, except ads CFT. Yes. So, so now the assertion is, the assertion is that um, quantum gravity is dual. So here's here's global at the sitter space. Uh, global rather than Poincaré because we want to surround everything. We want to capture everything that comes out. And so we could imagine in ADS space forming a black hole, which then evaporates. And this is dual to some... Pro so this is just an outline of the argument. This, this is dual to some process in the CFT. And since the CFT is just a gauge theory, we understand gauge theories, we know they satisfy ordinary quantum mechanics and pure states evolve to pure states, it must be that, that, um, that a pure state evolves to a pure state. So it can't be this. And a more refined argument that I'll come to later excludes remnants. It, says that, it really says that, that, that a black hole is an ordinary thermal object. And indeed, under the duality, and I'll actually go into this a little bit more later on. Under the duality, um, the, a, a black hole maps to simply a thermal equilibrium state of the thermal field theory. So it really is some universality of thermal behavior. So what I want to do, and I probably won't finish this lecture, but my next part of my lecture is to put a little flesh on this, um, um, this argument. And the first, is, the first um, question that you might ask is, um, you know, why do you believe ADS CFT so much? You know, we know that something is breaking down. We know that effective field theory might be breaking down. Why, of all of the things that you're going to believe in, why are you going to believe in ADS CFT? So the point of view I want to take is that I'm going to talk about a theory whose exact definition, whose exact definition is given by the, the uh, gauge theory. And... I want to assert, that, and I'm going to define quantum, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm talking about whatever theory of quantum gravity is dual to that. I'm asserting that this defines some theory of quantum gravity. And there's strong evidence for that. So first of all, um, actually, do I need to? Ah, good. First of all, um, for example, one of the things we know definitely because of supersymmetry is that um, there is a complete set of ADS graviton states. That is, there are states in the Hilbert space of the conformal field theory that are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the states of a graviton or a gas of gravi a, a, a Fox space of gravitons uh, moving, and not just gravitons, of course, because this is the controlled cases are super are supersymmetric. A, a Fox space of supergravitons on ADS. Something one can also say um, is that the three-point couplings, the, that is basically the way, the way the gravitons couple to, to themselves and other things, are again the same as in supergravity. These are also protected by supersymmetry. So, so in particular, these gravitons couple to energy. These, these things we're calling gravitons couple to energy. Also, there are many, many... Um, different kinds of gauge theory physics, different phases, different perturbations of this, um, many of which are controlled by supersymmetry, others of which are just qualitatively very plausible, um, which, which are described by solutions to Einstein's equation. So many pieces of gauge theory physics can be matched to solutions to Einstein's equations that correspond to perturbate to, to, to ah, so, so the statement is that the metric, the metric goes to anti-de-sitter at large distance 
inside it's fluctuating freely. So, so solutions to Einstein's equations that are asymptotically ADS. And actually other pieces of other pieces of um, of gauge theory physics are also dual, and again, again, things that are controlled by supersymmetry, also dual to strings and brains, so that it's not just any theory of quantum gravity, it's in fact the theory whose ultraviolet completion is the 2B. In this, it, well, I'm sorry, whose completion in general is one of the dual versions of string theory, but I'll be talking, just for definiteness, I'll be talking about the the, uh, the canonical example, in which case the, the, the bulk theory is the 2B, the 2B string. Now, now um, let me, in fact, give you a few, um, let, let me, in fact, put some, um, specify a little bit more the, the example I want to focus on. And the example doesn't matter so much, but every once in a while I'll want to be definite. So, so this would be ADS5 cross S5. And I'll, 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 I'll talk about what the duality means in a second. But, but um, ADS cross 5 dual to, uh, the, dual to the N equals 4 uh, super Yang-Mills theory uh, with gauge group SUN. And there are some length scales. Um, there's the ADS radius, L sub A. There's the Planck length L sub P, and their radius, their ratio is the uh, size of the gauge group. So when the size of the gauge group is large, the ADS space is large compared to um, compared to the Planck length. Also, uh, the, another length scale is the string length, and the string length as compared to, so the, the ADS radius is compared to the string length. Uh, that ratio is lambda. Lambda is the tough parameter G yang mills squared n. So, so when, the coupling is, when the coupling is strong and the gauge group is large, uh, the ADS space is large compared to, to um, um, the, the microscopic scales. Now, um, one way this reason, so this, one way, one way this, re, so this, there's a lot, again, a lot of, a lot of, of evidence here, much of it based on supersymmetry. One way you could imagine the duality failing would be if, if there, there, there's, it's really rather surprising that a four-dimensional gauge theory, three plus one on the boundary is giving rise to a five or ten-dimensional theory in the bulk that the bulk theory is more local. You could imagine maybe that the bulk theory is less local than ordinary quantum gravity. Um, but it's really hard to make a consistent theory, consistent relativistic quantum theory that is not local. The one, one failure mode that is known, and probably the only failure mode, is it might be that on top of the quantum gravity that we want, there is an infinite number, a large, perhaps infinite number of additional light or massless degrees of freedom. And in fact, that's exactly what happens in this same system at weak gauge coupling. At weak gauge coupling, the string length is large compared to the ADS radius. We certainly don't expect any local physics in the bulk. And indeed, in this limit, an enormous number of stringy states become light compared to the scale of the box. Um, so that failure mode is known. It's the, only, it's the only failure mode that, you know, it's hard to think of other failure modes. And again, at strong coupling, um, there's every reason to expect that all of these states become massive. Again, there's no supersymmetry to protect their masses. And in fact, now with integrability, one can seemingly calculate their masses and follow them to to large mass as the coupling becomes strong. So, um, you know, I'm going to trust this argument more than anything else. This will be the last thing that I will give up. You can make a different choice if you want. Um, okay, questions? Could I ask for yes. To students, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I understood your problem with uh, black 
all and that is it. Well, we have, I think, also equally huge problem with the sitter and that is CFT correspondence. And this problem we will face in 10 billion years if that energy is really cosmological. Cost. Okay, the sitter I don't want to touch now. The sitter I don't want to touch. I'm a particle physicist. I'm a particle, see, AD, particle physicists like ADS because basically everything is contained in a box. You control the initial conditions. You control the final conditions. You cosmologists in your desitter space. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't want to talk about desitter space now. Yeah, yeah. But you agree that there is problem. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah, a desitter, desitter, the reason that we're thinking about the inside of the black hole is that we want to understand desitter space. Outside. Yeah. 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 I mean, the sit when you're a sitter, you're behind the horizon, as you told us. When you're behind the black, when you're inside the black hole, you're behind the horizon. So the inside of the black hole seems like a step for us particle physicists. The inside of the black hole is a step towards understanding quantum gravity in sitter space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, one more. I. I. I okay. I uh, by the way, I, and this is something I'm going to spend some time on. When did I? When should I? When, did I, when should I conclude? I. Can go on forever. Around twelve thirty. Twelve thirty. Okay. I'm not sure if I'll get to it today. I probably will. Um, but also, the gauge theory has states that are um, that look like black holes, and of course, that's important. And in fact, there's a very nice correspondence which I'll describe between the phase behavior of of black holes and um, the phase behavior of the corresponding thermal states in the dual gauge theory. Okay, so uh, one more thing. Let me write out the metric of ADS5. Plus, uh, of the, uh, um, I may occasionally need to point to it, so I'll write it out. So this is, this is global. This is global ADS space, uh, the space whose boundary is a a three sphere, and then there's the five sphere. Okay. Also, by the way, just to emphasize that the CFT lives on a compact space S three uh, across time. Okay, so, so I'll leave that for later use if I need it. Now, um, what does it mean to say that the, that the gauge theory on this space is the same as the um, quantum gravity string theory quantized on this space? Again, with, the, with, with, the, with boundary conditions that basically correspond to fixing the asymptotic behavior of the metric, but letting it fluctuate freely in the interior. And the first thing is a one-to-one -one correspondence of states. Um, that implies in particular that for every field in the bulk, I think I've used I for other things, but for now I labels the different fields in the gravity theory. There, for every field in the bulk, there is some local operator in the CFT, so bulk CFT. Okay, so this is one-to-one -one correspondence of states and also a one-to-one -one correspondence of certain observables, and the simplest observables um, are, well, in a, in a gauge theory, in a field theory, the simplest, observa so simplest observables are the correlation functions of the local operators, and indeed, there's a nice dictionary, which I like to write this way, uh, the limit as R goes to infinity of the bulk fields as a function of radius, time, and angles on the three sphere, the three sphere in, in the 85, uh, appropriately scaled, 
So each operator has some, each field has some corresponding mass and dimension appropriately scaled goes over to the local operator at the corresponding point of the boundary. So I should always have a picture of ADS. So the statement is that, that if you take a field in the bulk and you approach the boundary, it approaches the local operator. That seems extraordinarily plausible. Um, good. So Mark did not write the dictionary in this explicit form. Actually, given the fact that he only had one lecture, he didn't write it much at all. But this is, the, the dictionary is often quoted instead in terms of the, ah, so a, a, a bulk field as it approaches the boundary can be regarded as a perturbation of the boundary conditions. And so the way this is often stated is a relation between a perturbation of the boundary conditions and a, a certain, an insertion of a local operator in the dual theory and the equality of the partition functions. But I think this is, I find this more part of physical and, and easier to write. So that's the dictionary. So it's a, it's a dictionary of, um, of states and a dictionary of, of observables. There's other observables like Wilson loops that have their dictionaries, but they're, this, this, is, this is kind of enough to, um, to, for us. Now, um, now, coming back to the Hilbert space, in most quantum field theories, in most quantum field theories, you can, gen you, you can generate a general state by acting on the vacuum with a product of local operators. In fact, I think in some, ver in some versions of, of field theory, constructive quantum field theory, uh, this is an axiom. Um, and under the dictionary, that corresponds again to basically kicking the, the bulk with perturbations of the boundary conditions at a bunch of points, and that will introduce energy and excitations. And so in the bulk, this corresponds to throwing in some particles. And so um, the, the, Hil the, the, the specific Hilbert space in the bulk is just all states that we can reach by starting with the vacuum and, and throwing stuff in effectively from the boundary. And if we throw in enough energy in particular, and especially if we aim it right, we would expect to be able to make a black hole. So, so the Hilbert space includes, should include black hole states, but specifically black hole states that can form and collapse. So, so that's, my, that's, that's my Hilbert space, uh, states that can form and collapse in this way. Now, now um, okay, but what about ADS? I mean, suppose we solve the problem for black holes in ADS. I mean, what does it have to do with real black holes? So, um, you know, for me, ADS is just a box, and its size is arbitrary. I, gave, I think I've erased them, but I gave you the, si the parametric size of the box. But in particular, we could take the box to be large enough we could be so large that its size is larger than the lifetime of the black hole. So, so um, the black hole decays, its de decay products move outward, and before the black hole is done decaying before it even knows it's in a box. And so this is really just, um, this is really just because particle physicists are happier if everything's in a box. Um, but also, also, interestingly, this duality, um, again, is sharp precisely when the gauge theory, the gravity theory is sort of con controlled in this way. Um, but also, all of the arguments that imply the paradox still hold. As, I mean, they, 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 they don't depend, you know, the black hole sitting here in the middle, it feels a very small curvature. That doesn't change anything that I said. Is there a question? Yeah. Okay, so, so that's the role of ADS. So, um, but in the, time I have to, in the time I have left, I think I can do two things. The first is a bit of an aside. But I think it's worth mentioning because um, when you talk about the information paradox, you know, I think, I don't know, you know, you have to, you have to wonder in the, er, in the original version, is it really a problem? I mean, to show that there's a paradox, you've got to capture all the Hawking photons and do some kind of subtle quantum measurement on them and repeat this many times. And maybe the whole thing isn't a paradox because you really can't do this. And so, in fact, I think the first really sharp version of the Hawking paradox was in ADS space, and it's due to Maldacena. And he said, let's just consider a two-point function. So we're going to consider um, 
we're going to consider some state of the CFT, which, look, which, which, we're going to, which, 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 which looks like a black hole. And I'll describe in a little bit more detail what that means as we go along. But some state of the CFT, which looks like a black hole. And now let's just calculate, let's just consider an extremely simple thing, a two-point function. So one of these, I'm oh, sorry, this is a CFT object. One of these, so, so some local operator the CFT is a function of time and angle. Some other, that same operator at time zero. So just a two-point function in the, the um, graviton back, in, in, the, in the black hole background. So this corresponds physically to throwing something in and then later on asking is, what's the amplitude to find it back near the boundary? And clearly, if there's a black hole in the interior, there's a horizon, and, and um, there's going to be some continuous amplitude over time, probability, that, the, that this falls through the horizon. And once it's, once it's there, it can't get out. And so, again, low energy, the gravity as a, as a low energy effective field theory says that this thing falls exponentially in time forever. And you can, I mean, if, in fact, in fact, these exponentials are known as the quasi-normal modes. You can do the calculation and drop without bound. But now, what does the CFT say? The CFT, look, this, this is a gauge theory. This is a gauge theory on a three-sphere. And it's worth emphasizing. We have these control parameters, the number of colors, the size of the gauge group, and the gauge coupling. And we're imagining these to be large um, so that there's a, so the ADS, ADS space is large, but not infinite. They're never infinite. We're never taking a large, a, a, any kind of strict large end limit. So we have, we have a finite space, a finite size gauge group, a finite coupling. And so we expect a quantum field theory to have a discrete spectrum. And so we can instead insert a complete set of states here. No, a complete set of a complete set of energy eigenstates of the conformal field theory. Thank you. A complete set of energy eigenstates of the conformal field theory. Sorry. Um, I think I I'm I'm going to just write it over here because I'm. It's long enough that I'm going to. Um, sorry? Okay, I'll tell you what, Gore. I'll tell you. So, uh, I haven't told you. I'll t well, let's, let's come back to this. So, so I've inserted a complete set of states, and I have my energy. I have my energy. Um, uh, since, since this was originally a time t, and I've pulled it back to time zero, uh, I, get, I get a, a, um, you know, a, 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 an evolution factor here. Okay, so that's just the, that same two-point function expanded out. And now, and now. Um, if, this, if, 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 this, if this sum runs over discrete energies, uh, this, an expression like this can approximate an exponential for a very long time, but not forever. In fact, how do we see that? Well, we have, a finite, we have, we have effectively a finite number of terms. So uh, there's the black hole entropy. There's order e to the s terms here. There's order e to the s choices for b. So there is order e to the 2s terms. And initially, at least, this thing's of order 1. So each is of, each is of size, each of size e to the minus 2s to give an order 1 result. Over long time scales, the average size will be what? Well, we have this phase here. And over long time scales, this phase will be making, these phases are making very random excursions. Over long time scales, the average will be governed by root n effects, meaning that the phases will tend to cancel, and the remainder will be of order the root of the number of terms, uh, the square root of the number of terms times the typical size. So the average, typical, the long-term average, the 
the long term average, typical size is of order, the num again, the size of each term, the square root of the number of terms, which is e to the minus s. But, and it's small, but it never drops to zero. Um, and so the, the field theory says that this two point function um, drops to zero. The, um, the, 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 uh, sorry, the, the, the bulk theory says it drops to zero. The field theory says it, 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 it doesn't. And, um, and again, what's happening here is so, so in, for the black hole in, in ADA in Minkowski space, you've got to capture everything. Here, here the, um, the ADS is, do, is capturing it for you, directing it back on the original black hole. And the problem is transmuted, the, the discrepancy is transmuted into this discrepancy. In fact, um, and so it's a very, you don't have to measure n, some large number s uh, of, 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 um, of operators. You simply measure one of them, but of course you have to measure it, because you're looking for a small effect, you have to sort of measure it many times to high accuracy, but this, this shows you a con a, the most concrete version of the information paradox. And in fact, Eliezer and, and Jose Barbon showed in more, it, it's not, it may not be obvious that this is the same paradox. I think it's morally the same. And, and Eliezer and, and Jose Barbon showed that in fact, dollar matrix evolution gives you this kind of behavior. And so it's really the same, the same paradox. Um, Another way to think about this is another version of the paradox is effective field theory seems to think the black hole has a continuous spectrum. Effective field theory seems to think the black hole has a continuous spectrum. The truth is that it has a finite entropy. It has a discrete set of states. So another challenge is to solve this problem. What is missing from low energy effective field theory that would be responsible for giving the black hole a discrete set of states? Okay. Sorry? S, oh, S, 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 S is the black hole entropy. I, I, sorry, I left off the subscript, but S is the Beckenstein Hawking entropy. See? So E to the S, S is the, S is the black hole entropy. E to the S is the number of states, the number of states that contribute to, uh, effectively to, to, you know, in matrix elements. So, um, I can stop at any time. I'll tell you what I what I like to do next is, and I think I'll, it'll be the last thing I do today, is some dimensional analysis. So that's easy. It's a good, play, a good way to finish. Yes, Alex? So from this point of view, the problem looks to be non perturbative for n one, whereas before your argument suggested for the photo one. Good. Uh, good. So it's, it's, it's interesting because, in fact, um, so... There, it's, it's one of the things which is subtle about this paradox is that some effects are small and some effects are large. In particular, if I go to frequency space, if I go to frequency space, then the field theory calculation will give me some continuous spectral density, whereas the exact answer will be a series of poles. Good. In some ways, the difference between these is small, but if I look at a, if I look if I look over long time scales, so I can Fourier transform, the difference is large between having a delta function and having a smooth function. Um, but indeed, it it it, it, it yeah. I, I like the I like the page version because it really emphasizes something which is order one. But but indeed, that's that's an that's a that's a, that's a point to remember. Okay, dimensional analysis for ten minutes, and then we'll we'll go. So um, I'll, I'll start in four dimensions. So these are just things which, um, well, first, first is a few facts which are good to remember. Um, so the, for, this is, first of all, d equals four. Um, the Schwarzschild radius is the mass times g, which is the same thing as saying it's the mass um, in Planck units. Um, the entropy is, again, the area, so it's the Schwarzschild radius squared, um, and it's dimensionless, so that's in Planck units, and so using the above relation, it's the mass squared in Planck units. And um, 
and the lifetime. So the lifetime um, is what? So first of all, um, there's again one characteristic scale for a black hole, which is its Schwarzschild radius. The black hole emits of order one Hawking photon per light crossing time, per Schwarzschild time. So what are R sub s? And then we would have the ratio of the mass to the number of uh, so this is the total energy, this is the energy per Hawking quantum, and when, so this is, this is 1 over R sub s, this is R sub s, the whole thing works out to be m cubed over R sub s uh, to the fourth. So I, um, I think Slava used this before, so, so the, the, thing, the, the thing to things to remember are the lifetime of the black hole is m cubed, I'm sorry, in Planck units. The lifetime of the black hole is m cubed in Planck units. units. Uh, the entropy is m squared. Sorry, sorry. The entropy. Thanks. Inserting the correct dimensional factors is left as an exercise for the students. Yes, yes. OK. So the, the lifetime is m cubed in Planck units. The entropy is m squared in Planck units. The Schwarzschild radius is m in Planck units. There's another, uh, just one of these facts that's worth remembering, which is to compare the, um, the black hole entropy with the entropy of, ordinary, of, of, of a gas of ordinary matter of the, in, of the same total energy and in the same volume. So suppose we put a relativistic gas in a in a, a box of size L, then we're in four, four space-time dimensions, so the total energy is T to the fourth L cubed, the total entropy is T cubed L cubed. Um, uh, we can also, using the first relation, express this as the um, the mass times the length um, to the three quarters, and then um, if we now take the size of the box to be the Schwarzschild radius, then this becomes the mass times the Schwarzschild radius, um, this, which becomes uh, mass times the Schwarzschild radius, which is the mass squared. It, bec in it becomes the mass times L to the three-fourths. Okay, so this is for the gas. Let me put gas there. Uh, whereas for the black hole, uh, it's for, for the black hole, it's the, um, again, of order, the mass squared, Lp squared. So this is the area in Planck units. This is the area in Planck units. to the three quarters. And, um, and um, so this is, a, this is a, for a macroscopic black hole, this number is much smaller than this number. Moreover, remember the number of states, the number of states is exponential in the entropy. So it's in one case of order e to the area to the three quarters, in the other case e to the area. So you will hear reference to area to the three quarters and what that usually means is people are comparing the number of states of ordinary matter in the same mass and volume um, to the number of states of the black hole. And this has two consequences. The first is that if you form a black hole in collapse of ordinary matter, um, you will form it in an atypical state. If you want to sort of find, if you want to um, reach the the entire Hilbert space of the black hole, you have to go to some effort uh, forming it over a relatively long period of time by throwing quanta in, sort of the inverse of Hawking evaporation. Um, the, second, the second consequence is that if you're considering quantum gravity in a volume, almost all states are black holes. And um, almost all states are black holes. Their number, or rather the log of their number, 
is, is the area. And so this is what suggests that fundamentally um, quantum gravity is not a local theory but is holographic. The basic degrees of freedom live for, to describe quantum gravity in any volume live on, on the surface of that region. Okay, so I have some more dimensional analysis, but it's going to take more than five minutes, and I don't want to rush. So next time, we'll start off with some more dimensional analysis. Any questions? Yes? Oh. Ah, thank you.